Hello everyone, my name is Marnie Tichenell. I'm the Extension Wildlife Program Specialist for The Ohio State University. I'm based within the School of Environment and Natural Resources, usually. Welcome to my home office. Um, and the School of Environment and Natural Resources is within the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. So happy to be with you today virtually, uh, talking a little bit about wildlife conflict. Um, this is a subject that I speak on quite frequently. I often get questions from homeowner, homeowners and landowners um, about wildlife issues and how to prevent them. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Today we're going to be talking about skunks, raccoons, and possums. So originally I was asked to do a program on skunks, but I looped in raccoons and possums because they fit well into the same discussion of damage management. Often the same things you can do around your home to prevent issues with skunks um, will do the same thing to prevent issues with raccoons and possums. So that's why we, we looped in these other two critters today. We are living with wildlife. There's no doubt about that. And it doesn't matter where you are living. If you are living in a rural area or in a major metropolitan area or anywhere in between, you are living with wildlife, whether you know it or not. And all of these species that you're looking at right now, um, I, I frequently get questions on, and I'm sure many of you have experienced issues or conflicts, um, or maybe just even seen every single one uh, of these critters, uh, maybe at least once. Um, so all of these species are very good at coexisting with us. They've become very comfortable within our habitat. So when we live together, of course, conflict can occur. And um, this is a big issue nowadays. It keeps me very busy, uh, as, do, as it also keeps a lot of my wildlife colleagues uh, busy. So I, I always like in these talks to kind of take an overall look at as to why this is happening and what's going on uh, in the world right now um, that influences the prevalence of, of wildlife conflict. And so one of the big reasons is the land cover changes we are seeing. Um, and uh, for example, as we increase development within our state and within our, um, within our country, uh, that can have a huge impact on wildlife conflict. So when we uh, move out closer to natural areas, uh, especially if there are, as there often are, established wildlife populations in those natural areas, um, that brings us closer to those populations, closer to that wildlife. And so, of course, at that point, conflict can occur. Um, there's also the case where we are replacing some of that natural habitat uh, with our own habitat. An example would be like you're, you're looking at right here in the picture. Um, I live in uh, southern Delaware County, very close to Franklin County, uh, and to the Polaris area, which is just booming and growing. And every year I watch more and more acres of farmland um, go towards housing developments. So, um, you know, so there's the, these land cover changes are definitely impacting our wildlife. Um, and in some, in many cases, taking away uh, some of the habitat that they need. But I don't want to just paint this issue that it is our fault as humans. Um, we're definitely playing a role, but the wildlife um, are playing a role as well. So they learn that um, no matter where we are living, um, that there are or there is good habitat um, in our areas. So remember, habitat for wildlife is the food, water, and shelter they need to survive. And they have learned that our human habitats provide those resources. And, you know, oftentimes it is not our intention to provide those resources for wildlife, but um, it happens anyways. And wildlife, uh, they don't really pay attention to property, property boundaries, right? They have this kind of mentality, well, what's out there? What's yours is mine, right? Uh, and I, I love this uh, picture that was recently sent to me. Um, it's just, it just so encompasses the feisty uh, nature uh, and intelligent nature too of raccoons, especially when it comes to food. 
So when it comes to that habitat creation, you know, whether we're conserving natural areas or we're, we're putting in a community garden or, you know, doing some things in our own backyards, we are putting that habitat out there and the wildlife recognizes that it is there. So I like to go over the steps for managing wildlife damage and just really quickly, the definition of, of wildlife damage is the timely use and appropriate timely use, excuse me, of appropriate and cost effective control methods to reduce damage to a tolerable level. Um, and so that tolerable level is a is a key point and we will get back to that uh, in just a minute. So number one step is to identify the species responsible. Um, with the species we're talking about today, our skunks, our raccoons, possums, um, oftentimes, sometimes the issue is seeing those animals. Um, seeing them, you know, pop out of uh, underneath your porch or maybe a, a, a den space underneath your shed. Uh, but there are some damage signs that these critters leave behind and, and I'll address some of those uh, a little bit later in case you're not quite sure um, who the critter is that, that's causing that damage you're seeing. So that is the most important step because once you identify the species causing the damage, that is going to um, dictate the best um, management options, the best strategies to take to prevent any further conflict or damage. Number two, understand the species habitat needs. This is really important. Um, you know, do a little homework, do a little research on the, the species that's causing an issue. And sometimes that goes a long way to solving the problem. And so I often take this approach in, in the talks that I give in that I almost always include a little bit about the habitat needs of these species. And so we are gonna talk about that for raccoons, skunks, and possums here in just a little bit. Number three would be make cost effective decisions to bring damage down to a tolerable level. So there we go back to that definition of managing wildlife damage. Um, now that tolerable level is gonna be different for every person, right? Um, you know, it might be uh, a lot higher than your neighbors. So it, that's up to you to, to figure out where that, that tolerable level is. And I apologize if there is a lot of noise in the background, there is a, a, a rainstorm going on as I'm recording this. Uh, number four would be employing management options. So if you, um, you know, it's the damage or the conflict you're, um, you're having is more than your tolerance level, then you decide, okay, I need to do something. And so we're gonna be talking about different management options for our skunks, raccoons, and possums today. Just remember that some of them require persistence, uh, commitment, and you always want to uh, continually monitor um, the situation because the wildlife will keep you guessing. <laughs> so, um, they'll, and they'll test you. So if you uh, employ an option, um, you do wanna make sure that uh, it's still working. So here are the options for managing wildlife damage. When you encounter an issue or damage with any species, these are kind of the options that you can always go back to. Now, some of these are going to be more um, applicable to raccoons, skunks, and possums than others. Now I would like to get into a little bit about the ecology and the habitat of our featured species here today, our skunks, raccoons, and possums. So what you're looking at is the order carnivora. Um, so a, a level of classification in which we find all of our animals that prey on other animals. There are 11 families um, within this order and you see the six that reside here in Ohio. Um, so looking down at that list, you're, you're very familiar with them, I'm sure. Uh, and just to, to point out the species that we're going to be talking about, um, that second one down, family Mephetidae, that would be our skunks and uh, uh, stink badgers, though we don't have stink badgers here, we just have skunks and just one, which is the striped skunk. And that's the picture you're looking at uh, right there on the upper right. And then going down to the family uh, Procyonidae, that would be the family in which our uh, raccoon resides. And then what is not on here is our possum. And we will look at how that, that one, uh, that species is, is classified here in just a few minutes. Starting with the striped skunk. 
This is the only species of skunk in Ohio. I think it's very easy to identify. I don't think anyone will ever mistaken uh, a skunk for another animal, uh, unless of course you're Pepe Le Pew. Did anybody else grow up watching that cartoon? I did. Uh, but this, uh, this wildlife species, habitat-wise, it prefers woodland edges, grassy fields, and it is perfectly comfortable in backyards. As far as foods, it, you know, as we looked about it, is, it is classified as a carnivore. Um, so it does eat other animals, but I, I think all of these species we're talking about today, our skunk, our raccoon, and our possum, are often um, more omnivore uh, in nature omnivorous in nature. And so they eat a lot of different things, bees uh, and wasps and other insects. And we'll talk about that a little bit later um, because some of the damage that skunks can cause is related to them digging around for insects. But they will also eat small animals as well. So sometimes mice and rats around your home can work to attract a skunk. Moving on to our raccoon, that black bandit mask is, is so appropriate because this animal really can cause a lot of trouble. Not to say that they always cause trouble, but I get some really interesting questions and uh, because there are some raccoons out there doing some interesting things and we'll, we'll talk about a few examples here in a minute. Um, but if you notice there, they are an animal of the woods and wetlands. Um, so typically you'd see them in wooded areas along streams and rivers or in other wet areas. Now they have adapted. Uh, you see them in a variety of habitats, including, of course, our human habitats. They are extremely opportunistic. So like we talked about with skunks, uh, they are carnivores, but uh, they eat a lot of different things. Uh, and when it comes to raccoons, they're going to really take advantage of any food that they come across. And they're not really going to be limited uh, you could say. They are intelligent. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, their manual dexterity here in just a minute. And um, they have adapted well to humans. And I should have mentioned this earlier, but both raccoons, skunks, and opossums, they all um, use underground dens uh, during the mating season. So the females will look for a den um, to raise her pups. And that is um, often a um, cause of conflict for homeowners, and we are going to address that. Um, but that's another ha important habitat component that all three of these wildlife species are looking for. And just some fantastic pictures of raccoons and all of the interesting situations they can get themselves into when trying to obtain habitat. And their ability to obtain food is well known in the animal kingdom. Here is a note that a cat wrote to its owner. Thank you for forgetting to feed me this morning. I have now turned myself into a raccoon in order to get more food. Love your previous cat. So I want to take a minute to talk a little bit about the uh, manual dexterity and the tactile sense that raccoons have on their paws. So these tactile senses set raccoons apart from other carnivores. Carnivores are known for their keen senses. That's what makes them successful predators. And in raccoons, these keen senses include their paws. So you see a raccoon there giving a nice little high five. So they have highly developed nerves in their paws. This is why if you've ever watched a raccoon forage for food, it kind of pats around on the ground with its paws. And if you have heard that raccoons wash their food, that's not true. <laughs> They're not actually washing their food, um, but the water acts to make the, their um, those sensitive areas in their paw even more sensitive. So that is why sometimes they will um, get their hands wet or take food and dip it into water to really increase those tactile senses so they can really figure out even more, you know, what this food is and, and is it good to eat. So researchers are asking questions about um, about these highly developed nerves in, uh, in the raccoon paws. And they're wondering, okay, if raccoons are continuously stimulate, stimulated with new challenges um, connected to food, can they grow their brains? 
Okay, and so all of those nerve endings, they go to the frontal lobe of the brain. So they're asking, can they expand that frontal lobe of the brain? Can they actually get smarter? Hmm. I'm going to give you some examples of how raccoons are constantly stimulated with um, new ways to get food. So this is one example from my coworker, Kathy Smith, and this is her porch. And for a while she had, um, I don't think she does anymore. I think she took them down, but she had little lights all around her patio just to kind of light it up real nice. And they were just little domed lights and there was a little bulb that you just pop in, um, pop into that little dome and then they turned on. Well, for a long time, uh, those lights were missing. She couldn't find them and she couldn't figure it out. Finally, she decided to put out a trail camera. Always a great idea, by the way, if you don't know what's going on in your backyard. Trail cameras these days have become incredibly af uh, affordable uh, and it's a really great way um, you know, to figure out who's causing the issue. So she has her trail camera out and we had kind of suspected that it might have been raccoons because, you know, what other critter, you know, would would do such a thing, such a weird thing. It's usually raccoons. And so here you see a little raccoon. I'm going to slide through these pictures here, but going from light to light and looking for go back again so you can see it. Oh, I can't go back um, and looking for those light bulbs. Um, so the only thing that I could really think of is that maybe those light bulbs looked like an egg and that the raccoon was taking them and attempting to eat them. Um, so one great example as, as to <clears throat> how opportunistic raccoons are and how they can really work their hands up into these tight little places to, in this case, unscrew a light bulb and pull it out. Okay, here's another example. This was from several years ago um, where raccoons were sneaking onto Olentangy school buses, and this is the school district that I live in. And so this is fantastic. They interview one of the, the bus drivers whose name just happens to be John Coonfair. <laughs> fantastic. And they kind of ask him what's going on. Well, he said that the raccoons had figured out how to open the bus doors. You can see he's kind of opening them up with his foot. Uh, and they were getting into food that was stored in the councils next to the, the driver's seat. And so they thought, well, a quick and easy solution. We're going to put a little slide lock on those council doors and problem solved. Nope. I'm sure some of you are shaking your heads right now. Uh, the raccoons figured out how to open up that slide lock. Okay, so there's nothing like that in nature, you know, naturally occurring in, na in nature. Um, but this is a situation where they had to learn how to open up that lock and now they know how to do it. Okay, so, hmm, they're learning. Can they grow their brain? Ultimately, in this situation, what the school district had to do is uh, set traps on the, on the um, buses and remove those raccoons. So did we answer the question? Not really. Okay, the research is still out on if they can grow their brains, but suffice it to say, raccoons are quick learners and they have very good retention. So no worries that raccoons are going to take over the world anytime soon. Many of them are still figuring things out. Poor guy. This is actually, I make a joke about it, but this actually can be a serious issue. Um, wildlife do on occasion get their heads stuck into containers like this. Um, so if you ever see something like this, do please um, alert uh, your local authorities um, to help out that animal because um, oftentimes they cannot get their head out of that um, situation. Okay, let's move on quickly, talk a little bit about the Virginia opossum. So Virginia opossums, they belong to the order Didelphomorphia, and they are a marsupial mammal. So I didn't know if anybody has really had the opportunity to see an opossum uh, pouch, and so I wanted to show you a picture. And here's a little close-up. So you're looking at each one of those little peachy uh, pink um, young 
they have just recently been born. They've just recently been born. They made that journey um, from the birth canal to the mother's pouch. So possums, females are only um, actually pregnant for uh, 12 to 14 days. That's their gestation time. And then the, on average, seven to nine young, they start that journey uh, to the birth, con birth canal. Now, granted, it's not very far. It's only a couple inches. But, you know, when you're the size of a navy bean and the only thing that works are your little nubs uh, that are your arms, eh, it's kind of a tough journey. So they're going to spend the next 50 to 65 days in that pouch. And then after that, they'll hang around with the mother for a little bit. Sometimes they'll hitch a ride on her back. Some of them are a little bit more reluctant to leave that pouch than others, much like some of our kids, right? So that's the Virginia possum. As far as habitat, Virginia possum, they've adapted to a lot of different areas. Um, we find them within our habitats, uh, as well as more wooded areas on the outskirts of woodlands and, and sometimes in some more open areas as well. Um, they are also um, omnivores when it comes to food. Yes, they will prey on smaller animals, but they will take advantage of food as it is available. So much like what we looked at with our uh, skunks and uh, raccoons, they will also um, den underneath uh, a porch or uh, building foundations um, to take cover and to take shelter. We do have to talk just a little bit more about possums because I don't think they have a very good reputation, but there's some really neat things about possums that I'll just I'll throw on out there and I'll let you make up your mind about how you feel about possums. You know, for starters, they play dead, and this is a pretty neat ability. Um, oops, getting ahead of myself here. It's a pretty neat ability. Um, you know, they roll over, they become limp, they drool, they, uh, you know, this foul-smelling substance is emitted from um, their behind that just adds to this illusion that they are dead. Um, and this, um, this completely canatonic state can last a minute to six hours. Um, and sometimes it's effective and uh, sometimes it, it, it's not. But it's kind of an interesting um, ability uh, that, that they have. Another maybe lesser known ability of raccoons is that the chance of them contracting rabies is very rare. Um, they have lower body temperatures, which uh, scientists believe makes it more difficult for the virus to survive. So that's not typically something we have to worry about when it comes to possums. Now, skunks and raccoons um, can contract rabies. There uh, is not, thankfully, a big threat um, with that right now in Ohio. Um, so raccoon rabies may be the, the one to worry about a little bit more, and that's simply because um, there is raccoon rabies on the eastern border of Ohio into Pennsylvania. But thankfully, our wildlife agencies um, are working and have worked very, very hard um, over the past several years to vaccinate raccoons all up and down the Ohio border. And now you're probably wondering, how do they vaccinate that? That many raccoons. Well, they actually will drop bait um, from a, uh, a plane or a helicopter. And the bait is kind of like fish flavored bait. And the, va the rabies vaccine is within that bait. And that may sound silly, but it is very effective. Um, so that is how um, Ohio is keeping uh, raccoon rabies at bay. And of course, then those government agencies are um, trapping uh, raccoons quite regularly and testing them to make sure the vaccine is working. So thankfully, we don't um, have an issue with that right here in Ohio. Opossums are also tick terminators, so they groom themselves meticulously, and um, there was one research that looked at uh, the number of ticks groomed off and uh, off, off by opossums, and it was about 5,000 per year. So I'm good with anything out there that is going to decrease our tick populations. <laughs> And then last but not least, this is really cool. Some scientists believe that the possum um, may hold the key to developing a universal anti-venom. Okay, what do I mean there? Okay, so possums have a venom neutralizing peptide in their blood, which means that if they get bitten by a viper, uh, a snake, um, a pit viper snake, uh, it, here in Ohio, an example of that um, would be 
uh, a copperhead, then if they get bit by that, then nothing's going to happen, okay? They are essentially immune to it. Now, what this means, or what scientists are looking at, is that these possums, if they have this venom neutralizing peptide in their blood, maybe they can take that peptide and use it um, to create a universal anti-venom. Right now, if you get bit by a snake, the doctors need to know what species so they can match up the proper, proper anti-venom. But with a possum, they can get bit by different species of snakes and still be okay. So it would be really advantageous if you, you know, went to the doctor after getting bitten by a snake. It doesn't matter which species. They can just give you this universal anti-venom. Now, how close are we uh, to this actually happening? Well, not very close. This is just something that is newly being studied and some questions that are, are being asked. So we'll have to follow that research to see, see what happens. Okay, thanks for bearing with me uh, with all that information, maybe more than you wanted to know about skunks, raccoons, and possums. Now we're gonna get into, okay, what do we do about issues? Um, so number one, I wanna show a few pictures of damage uh, that you might be seeing, that you might be seeing. So who is the culprit here? In these pictures, you're looking at dug up areas of the lawn. Uh, so in that upper left picture, that's maybe a, a two to three inch diameter little shallow hole. Um, right down below it in the bottom left, you're seeing some more extensive damage. And then in the upper right, it's actually, uh, you know, the, the lawn has just been, the sod has just been rolled back. Um, so this is indicative of two of the species we're talking about here today, skunks, and raccoons. Okay, both of these critters will dig in the lawn as they are looking for insects. Okay, so let's let's look at that a little bit closer. Now, raccoons and skunks, they'll, the both of them will use their paws to dig holes or scrape. But if you're seeing areas of your lawn where it's almost as if you know the the grass has been rolled back, like you see there on the right, then that is going to be uh, more indicative of raccoons. Raccoons will also sometimes dig up newly planted flowers. Um, they will also um, get into planters and they will dig that up. Again, um, looking for insects, especially if that soil has recently been disturbed and turned up. You know, as you do that, sometimes you can bring more of those insects up closer to the surface or surface if you're turning that soil up. And so that will attract um, raccoons and sometimes skunks to those areas. Other conflicts that raccoons, skunks, and possums can cause are kind of uh, uh, pictured here. So denning underneath building foundations, underneath decks or porches or patios, um, getting into trash, as you can see there on the right uh, of the possum there. And um, you know, sometimes, uh, this brings up another point, sometimes um, raccoons, skunks, uh, and possums will get themselves into a trash can or maybe another area, sometimes the, uh, the window well for your basement, and they can't get back out. So if you ever encounter that, um, you know, just grab a two by four, stick it down in there and just walk away, give them a couple minutes, and they'll kind of uh, walk their way out um, on their own uh, when they're comfortable. Um, but these are two other uh, conflicts I I often uh, see with these critters. So what are the management options? We are going to discuss repellents. We're going to discuss a lot about habitat modification and we'll touch a bit on trap. So as far as repellent, uh, repellents are concerned. Okay, so repellent, this is something that you can spray uh, that either gives a bad taste to whatever you're trying to protect um, sometimes if it's a plant the animal's chewing on, or if you're trying to keep them away from an area, um, it'll have a bad smell. And so this picture that you're looking at here, I, I believe this was a garlic oil-based repellent, and it was labeled for use on raccoons. Um, and my coworker was using it to keep raccoons from digging up her potted plants. It did not work. Maybe you can tell from that picture, but it had the opposite intended effect. The raccoons actually attempted to 
eat it. Um, so there's two marks up and down the bottle. So my point here is even though there are repellents labeled for use on raccoons and skunks, they are not effective. So don't waste your time and, and definitely don't waste your money. Okay, let's move into habitat modification. This is a big one when it comes to skunks, raccoons, and possums. What is habitat modification? So this is identifying the component of habitat that is attracting the animal in the first place. It's usually food or shelter and modifying that component or eliminating it to solve the problem. We know that we're living with wildlife and if we can figure out what is bringing them into our yards and remove that so they don't stop and stay, that can go a long way to um, to solving a lot of a lot of our issues. So a good example would be that damage we talked about earlier uh, with raccoons and skunks digging up the lawn um, to access insects. And in that bottom right picture, you see some white grubs there. Uh, so that would definitely explain why these animals are digging in the soil. It's, that's some good food right there. So what do you do about this situation? Well, you do have the option to treat your lawn for um, the grubs, and that might help to reduce the damage. I say may help because you do have to make sure you are using a product that is going going to um, immediately control the insect population. So you're immediately removing that food source. Some of the products don't take effect until a little bit later on um, in the season. And by that time, the skunks and the raccoons will have moved on anyways. Um, keep in mind, there still are other insects in the soil uh, that are available to them. They will eat other insects besides grubs as well. So last but not least, patience sometimes works. Uh, a lot of times skunks and raccoons are just kind of moving across the landscape and they may be in your yard one day and be gone the next. So, you know, if, if you're not having a lot of damage, uh, then you might be okay just uh, waiting for those animals to move on. I'm going to pop up this article really quickly. This is an article that was written by one of my uh, colleagues who's an entomologist, and he was reviewing the different products that you can use for white grub control. So that's a good one to read um, if you, you know, need a little bit more information on which of those products uh, will have that immediate um, control. So uh, BYG, that stands for Buckeye Yard and Garden Line. If you're not familiar with that, it is an OSU blog site, um, and it's it's phenomenal. It is um, the blog articles are submitted by numerous folks uh, with OSU Extension um, and various departments that have um, a specialization in horticulture. So you get very timely articles on. Um, insect issues, plant issues, lawn issues. Um, I'm on every so often, every so often uh, on the wildlife side with issues. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're concerned about your lawns or your gardens or your landscape, um, this is definitely a site you want to check out. So that is Buckeye Yard and Garden Line, and it's .osu.edu will get you to the site. Uh, and then if you do that node, it, node 855, that will get you to the white grub article. So let's talk a little bit more detail about habitat modification now that we know the general idea. You know, it's it's basically when it comes to all of our critters that we're talking about today, our three species, it's removing food sources and it's removing shelter uh, and potential den sites. So let's look at some examples of what that might be. Okay, obviously garbage. <laughs> That's a big one, right? Um, so, you know, when it comes to garbage, just making sure that the receptacle you're using is nice and heavy and it's not easily tipped over. It has a nice secure lid. Um, and I know many of the trash cans in communities now, they're heavy enough that they aren't really bothered um, by these critters. But um, it's still something to think about, especially if you have, you know, the situation in that picture right there. Also keep in mind that all three of these critters are primarily uh, nocturnal, so they're gonna be doing a lot of their, most of their foraging for food at night. Uh, so be aware of food resources that are available at night. So don't put your trash out at night if you don't have a secure receptacle. Pet food. <laughs> um, Nothing wrong with feeding your pets outside, just make sure you're bringing in the unfinished food inside because uh, there are definitely some other critters that will take advantage of that. Fruit trees, if you have any fruit trees in your backyard, um, watch them. Um, 
and if you can stand it pick the fruit maybe a little bit earlier because the wildlife they are waiting for that perfectly ripe apple or perfectly ripe uh, fruit just like you are and they will likely get to it before you do um, and unfortunately especially in the case of raccoons a female and her kits they will clean a tree a fruit tree in a single night so if you've ever, you've ever had a situation where you're watching your fruit tree and the next morning the fruit's just gone unbelievably gone uh, it's probably raccoons um, you know and and so just think about any other potential food, right? Um, something like this, like a hummingbird feeder that you wouldn't necessarily think about, um, but raccoons will figure out a way uh, to get to that. Controlling rodent populations. Remember going back to how these animals are carnivores? Um, skunks especially will stop and stay in a yard and maybe den underneath a barn or a shed that has uh, mice and rodents or um, mice and rats uh, also living in it so sometimes controlling those rodent populations you're removing that attractant you're removing that prey source um, and uh, you know telling that skunk or raccoon there's no food here don't don't stop and stay and then along the same lines you know removing shelter and den sites and you know shelter could be any debris um, around your property lumber debris slash piles if you're doing some landscaping and you're leaving the brush laying around um, rock piles um, those can all be shelter for any of these critters and then you know spaces under barns sheds uh, garages any access to underneath the foundation of buildings um, skunks, raccoons, possums will all take advantage um, of those spots. I mentioned something in the last slide about these animals being nocturnal and so I do want to address a common question I get. If I see a raccoon or skunk during the day, does that mean that it's sick? No. <laughs> the answer is no. Okay, so, you know, as we are sharing living spaces with these animals, as they're getting more comfortable with us, it, it it may not be uncommon to see a skunk or possum or raccoon during the day. It does not necessarily mean they're sick. Um, it could just mean that maybe they're, they've been foraging longer uh, hours to find enough food for themselves or for their young. Um, maybe they're taking advantage of a food supply in your yard when the dog is inside and not there to chase them. Um, or maybe they're just moving across the landscape to a new location. So lots of different reasons, reasons but it doesn't necessarily um, mean that they are sick. Now, here are some signs that should be a red flag and, and maybe should be, uh, if you see these, this is the time that you should call your, um, your local police department or animal control officer. So if the animal isn't responding to loud noises or um, movements nearby, um, and if its movement is off, maybe it's staggering or wobbly or you know wandering around erratically, or if you see um, any discharge from the mouth or the eyes. Also, if it's clearly injured, um, that injury may be self-inflicted, which can be a sign of disease. On the other hand, the animal could just be injured for some reason, in which case uh, it still needs help and you should call someone. So those are kind of some of the, those red flags. Um, oftentimes, you know, we have that intuition if we see an animal and it just isn't acting right. Um, you know, don't hesitate, call somebody. It's better safe than sorry. Um, but if you're just seeing these animals and they're, you know, wandering they're walking normally you clap your hands or you go outside and they run away that's that's normal behavior and that's nothing to worry about let's talk a little bit about trapping now trapping is a successful management option uh, for um, raccoon skunks and possums when you've really done your due diligence with habitat modification and you're still having damage you're still having issues uh, with these critters sometimes we we turn to trapping um, to remove that animal from our yard um, trapping is also a good tool if you have one of these animals living underneath um, underneath your porch or in your home and you need to get it out okay um, 
I do want to note something else on this slide. Maybe you're noticing that raccoon on the right side. It's a very different color. Um, there is some variation in the fur uh, of raccoons, and so this is a very orange one. I wouldn't say it happens very often, but it, it does happen, and it doesn't mean that it's a different species. Um, the same could be said for our skunk, uh, our striped skunk. We, we do see some uh, variations in the width of that white stripe or the white stripes on the back. So sometimes uh, you can very clearly see those two stripes like you see on the skunk there in that picture, but sometimes those stripes can be very wide and bold where it almost looks like the skunk is uh, completely white on the back. So um, nothing wrong with the skunk. It's not a different species. We just see some, some variation um, with the fur when we go from you know individual to individual. So let's talk a little bit more about trapping laws in Ohio, uh, because you know it's it's important to understand these before you set a trap to catch these critters, um, because you you are required by law to do specific things once you have these animals in a trap. And you can see here I've included some other Ohio wildlife just for your information. So um, for raccoons, skunks, possums, beaver, fox, and coyote, these um, are the species where if you live trap them, you have to then re-release them back on the site in which they were uh, captured. Or you can kill them or you know euthanize them, humanely kill them to prevent uh, potential disease transmission. So that's why this law is in place for these species. So all the ones we're talking about today. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, we don't we don't trap a sick animal, but if perchance we do, you don't, last thing that you want to do is relocate that animal to another population that it could potentially expose. Okay, so they cannot be relocated and that goes anywhere, anywhere, a wildlife area or a park, you cannot relocate them to those areas. Now, um, another note, squirrels, moles, voles, and you can read that list there. Um, with these species, you, um, you can also kill them humanely euthanize them. You can also re-release them back on site and you can relocate them. But there is a caveat to that re relocation and that relocation must be outside the city or village of capture and you have to have the permission of the recipient landowner. So uh, wildlife areas, uh, state or public lands, um, metro parks, county parks, they're not going to allow you to drop off um, a, a nuisance animal. They have enough wildlife of their own. So, you know, if you know a friend or a family member outside of the city or, or village of capture that doesn't mind you dropping them off, then, uh, then you are within your rights to do that. Since we've been talking about trapping, I like to share this list. Um, I understand many of you may not be comfortable with trapping, and so there are folks that can help you. And this list of nuisance wild animal control trappers, they can help you uh, with any um, nuisance wild animal problem through any uh, just about every any stage of the process. So if you have an animal in a trap and you need them to pick it up, then they can do that for you. Uh, this slide is kind of telling you where to find those individuals. This is the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife website and I have circled in red there where you can find that list and uh, that blue box is kind of how you navigate to that list. So it is organized by county so you can kind of clue right into where you are and get a list of folks. Now, um, these are uh, professionals for hire, and just like any other type of business, they're competitive. So call around, shop around, find somebody that you like, that you're comfortable talking with, and that gives you, you know, confidence in, um, in their abilities. Now, this is a really important uh, subject that I, I don't want to gloss over. Um, so as we've been talking about trappings, I want to um, stress that it, it isn't always the best option to remove an animal um, from an attic, as is the case in this situation, or from under a porch um, this time of year. Okay, so um, this time of year, um, spring through summer, that is breeding time and mating time and, and birthing time uh, for our raccoons, skunks, and possums. So they're having their young right now. So if you have an animal denning somewhere on your property, uh, you always want to assume that it is a mother with young. 
It may not be, but you want to make that assumption because the last thing that you want to do is trap that mother and remove it uh, and maybe even euthanize her and um, have those young with without a mother and now you're having to deal with those young. Um, so I do I do want to caution you against that that situation because this happens very very often. So every year wildlife um, centers they receive hundreds of requests to take orphaned raccoons because you know well-meaning people trapped the mother. And the reality is, is that the centers, they don't, they don't always have the resources to care for all of these raccoons and they have to end up euthanizing them, um, or they simply don't accept them unless it's for a euthanasia. Uh, so, you know, if the thought of separating young raccoons and skunks and, um, from their mothers, if that really bothers you, um, then, you know, you might want to think twice and think hard about, about trapping, um, or just realize, you know, if you trap an adult, um, you, you may have the young to, um, to contend with as well. So what do you do? I have some options listed here, um, that are so, you know, non-trapping, non-lethal options to help encourage, um, in this example, a raccoon to leave, uh, leave an attic. Um, so you can use sound and light. Um, so raccoons, especially mama raccoons, they're choosing, um, you know, attics or maybe spots under your porch because they're dark, they're quiet, and they feel safe. So if you take those away, there's a good chance that, that she will pick up and leave. And, and mama raccoons, uh, are, are, um, very good at picking up her young and leaving if she th senses a threat. Um, so what you can do is use sound. You can tune a radio to a talk station. Okay, The sound of human voices is often more uh, threatening to raccoons or fearful um, than just loud music. So turn it up as loud as you can stand it. It doesn't have to be blaringly loud, though, to be effective. And then use light, too. You can place a, a bright light at the den entrance, inside and out, if you can manage that. Um, of course, make sure it's fire safe. Um, so outdoor spotlights, clamp lamps, uh, and mechanic lights are some good options. And um, yeah, place those as close as you can to the entrance and, and then try to be patient. Okay, wait for them to leave. You know, your other option is to do nothing until, you know, August, September. By that time, many of our, our wildlife mamas have taken their young out of buildings and are, you know, foraging around the landscape. Um, so you can be patient and wait for them to move on out on their own. So um, I do want to give a special thanks to Barbara Ray. She's with the city of Dublin uh, and she um, provided this, uh, this excellent, um, a PDF on these uh, harassment techniques for uh, for raccoons and addicts. So um, I did want to give her credit for that. So thanks, Barb. So in summary, to avoid issues with our skunks, raccoons, and possums, uh, remember that habitat modification, remove any potential food resources, prevent access to potential den sites. You know, once you, um, maybe maybe if you have to remove an animal from the den site, or maybe um, you are walking around your property and you, you find some openings that you feel like you should close up, uh, you know, you can use rocks, you can use some wire mesh. Um, but one thing I will tell you to do, especially this time of year, is ball up some paper you know, some newspaper and stuff it in that hole and then watch it for about three days. If it doesn't move, you know nothing's in there, okay? And then you can, you know, remove that paper and seal it up. But if that paper moves, then something might still be living in there. So always, always make sure that um, a, a densite is empty before you permanently seal it up. And then coexistence is key. And what I mean by that is just recognizing that we are living with these species. We will always be living with these species. They're not gonna go away. And so we do, each of us need to work on that tolerance level. And, you know, we have to find that that coexistence that, that makes us comfortable. Um, so. 
So when coexistence is a little bit more difficult because your dog got a little too curious with that black and white animal in the backyard, um, I did want to share this de-skunking spray with you. It's uh, basic ingredients that many of us probably already have around the house, hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and liquid soap. Um, so you mix this all together, scrub your pet down, um, do avoid sensitive areas, so don't use this on the face um, and other sensitive areas of your pet because it is hydrogen peroxide so that can be irritating of course um, but scrub it in rinse it well and repeat if necessary um, this the same um, spray can or de-skunking spray or solution can also be used on hard surfaces that skunks have also sprayed um, don't bottle it because it can generate oxygen and uh, explode which is not something we need <laughs> So good luck in your dealings with wildlife. I hope you don't have too much conflict. And remember, um, in other parts of the world, it could be worse. So thankfully, we aren't dealing with these, uh, these critters in our backyards, right? Uh, I, I did mention just a little bit on orphaned wildlife when we were talking about raccoons and um, myself, you know, being home, I have really been paying attention even more so and had the opportunity to pay attention to the wildlife in my backyard. And I've seen um, a, quite a few uh, young wildlife species. And as you can see from these pictures, they've mostly been birds. So we have grackles there on the left and some morning doves on the right. And in both cases and, and a few other examples, I've seen young um, wildlife being left alone for a good amount of time. And this is normal. This is typical with many of our wildlife mamas. Um, they don't want to attract undue attention to their babies. And so they stay away, especially during the day. Um, so just, just a little word of caution. If you, um, if you see that, don't immediately jump to the, the case that they are orphaned, um, but keep an eye out. And if you don't see that parent return um, in a couple hours, then you know that might be the time when you call somebody for help. So we do have licensed wildlife rehabilitators that will take in injured and orphaned wildlife, fantastic group of people, and you can access that list at uh, wildohio.gov. So that is the um, Division of Wildlife website. I showed it earlier for the uh, nuisance wild animal control operators, and so you can get a list of rehabbers on that same site. And once again, that blue box kind of directs you uh, to where that list is on the site. So thank you all so much. Uh, I could not resist a Star Wars theme joke there at the end, so I apologize if you don't understand that. Um, I, I do truly hope you don't have too many issues with wildlife, but if you do, please get in touch with me before you get too terribly frustrated. Um, email is the best way to get in touch with me um, right now as I am working from home, so please don't call my office phone. Just shoot me an email. I check it almost daily. Uh, so thank you all very much.